which is Chris Froome's current lead over Fabio Aru, funnily enough. Uh, this year's route to Perigude is 214 and a half kilometres, setting out from Po and tackling the Col de Monte and the super category Port de Balaise before the double kick up over the Perasord to Perigude. Plenty of scope for Froome's rivals to attack him or for him to attack them. Got two uphill finishes left, and tomorrow is tomorrow's one of them. Um, it's, it's definitely going to help shape the GC even further, I think. On, on our behalf, I don't think we really want to let any people come back onto GC. Um, so it's going to be about really trying to control things from the start and not, not allowing any of the GC guys who have lost time already to, to come back into the game. But will you attack? <sighs> I mean, I don't need to at this point, but let's see. Let's see what happens out on the road. So here's how the race stands entering the Pyrenees. Doubtless it'll be different coming out. Chris Froome has 18 seconds over his nearest rival, Fabio Aru. Juan Bardet is at 51 seconds and Rigoberto Oran at 55. Then the gaps get bigger. Jakob Fulsang is at 1 minute 37, riding with two small fractures in his wrist and another in his elbow after coming down yesterday. Dan Martin is at 1.44, largely because of his stage nine crash. Simon Yates is just over two minutes behind Froome and leading the best young rider competition. Naro Quintana is at 2.13 and yet to show anything like a serious challenge. I had some complications during the Giro. Sometimes you prepare and the good luck goes or the bad luck sometimes you find and that's inevitable. Eso hace pues que se estropeen tus planes y, y lo que has pensado de hacer. Eh, ahora nos presentamos aquí, esperamos pues que la buena suerte nos acompañe y las fuerzas y que todo vaya bien. Bueno, creer muchas cosas y poder pues uh, no lo sé. Eh, esperamos que las fuerzas estén de nuestro lado, nos acompañen. There's the start in Po. 179 riders left in the race. Astana's Dario Cataldo went down yesterday, so Aru and Fulsang will be one mountain helper down. Across France on Mont Ventoux, meanwhile, around 250 people will be gathering close to the top to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Tom Simpson's death there in the Tour de France of 1967. Former teammates Barry Hoban, Vin Denson and Colin Lewis will be there. Bradley Wiggins is among those expected to ride up. And at the centre of the commemorations will be his widow Helen and daughter Joanne, who, with the help from the Belgian sponsors of Thomas de Ghent, the last man to win on Mont Ventoux, has had the monument restored and the 13 steps leading up to it refaced. Back on the roads of the tour, Thomas de Ghent was in the break when it settled down. So was Steve Cummings, so it was a group of some calibre. And it also contained Marcel Kittel and Michael Matthews out to contest the intermediate sprint before the big climbs began. And it was close when they did, although not quite photo finish material. Matthews took it to trim Kittel's green jersey lead by three, with de Ghent mopping up third for André Greipel. Matthews wasn't done there, though. With his teammate Warren Barguil leading the King of the Mountains competition, he had the job of stopping Thomas de Ghent from picking up maximum points on the Col de Monte and perhaps beginning to close in on Barguil. He did it comprehensively and kept going down the other side just for fun. Marcel Kittel had no other post-sprint duties, just getting to the finish as painlessly as possible, and he slipped backwards into the main field, which was being driven by Sky in full formation. On the climb of the Port de Balaise, Luke Rowe and Vasil Kirienka peeled off, but Froome still had Kwiatkowski, Landa, Enau and Nieve to work for him. Up front, the break has disintegrated as we join commentary with Thomas de Ghent and Steve Cummings out ahead on their own and Romain Bardet's AG2R teammate Cyril Gauthier trying to join them. And Steve Cummings has dropped uh, Thomas de Ghent. His head is bowed to the Belgian. Cummings sees that the pace is starting to tell for Thomas de Ghent. And de Ghent uh, just acknowledges as Cummings, who's been sitting on his wheel for a while, just goes past him. De Ghent doesn't even try and respond. That was an explosive move. Steve Cummings is at it again. He has the head of the race. He's got two and a half minutes over the yellow jersey group and nobody to work with. So all in now for Steve Cummings. A few kilometres to climb now. The best part of three k to go until he solos which he surely will do will he as now warren bagheel attacks from the front of the yellow jersey group uh, he will try and chase down steve cummings who is on his own on the port de balaise contador is the next rider to attack 
And now is there going to be a response from the yellow jersey group? So Alberto Contador, who has struggled and looked in poor form. He had a nasty spill on the road yesterday on that flat sprinter stage. He looks at the polka dot jersey of Warren Baguil. He looks at the riders ahead of him on the road, and that uh, brilliant racing brain will be making the calculation about whether to commit to this move. Has he done enough damage? What will the reaction be? So Alberto Contador, it's uh, perhaps a move born of desperation as he finds himself over five minutes down in the GC. But he's found the strength within him to ignite this race close to the top of the Porte de Ballets. And look, Team Sky are trying to shut it down. They're not letting anything go. Even though they're not GC threats, they're just trying to keep this. They, they know how much damage they're doing. They can see it. They'll be getting news on the radio. They won't be looking behind much. This is, uh, this is important. Talansky there. It's uh, Serge Powell's from Dimension Data. Is that Nairo Quintana just ahead? No. Uh, I think I'm can't see if it is. It's not looking no, very good. No, it's not. Andre Amador. Oh, that's Carlos Betancourt. Carlos Betancourt, Carlos Betancourt, Betancourt who's gone. Yeah. yeah, in the gloom. It's hard to pick oh, his rider wow. out at the moment, yeah. but that's been brought back by Mihail Kwiatkowski. Feyu back in the fold after his attack. Uh, Bagui back in the yellow jersey group. He's thinking about King of the Mountains points, though. And Alberto Contador. Well, can he go again? Will he go again? Can he hold his place, first and foremost, in this yellow jersey group? Meanwhile, at the head of the race, he's got an advantage of over two minutes. Steve Cummings has dropped Cyril Gauthier. Uh, he has dropped Thomas de Ghent, uh, who has now, I think, been passed. And there's de Ghent now up in the, on the road ahead of him and in danger of dropping down to third place on the road, which was not what he had in mind when he accelerated and broke the cohesion of the breakaway group. Uh, into pieces. De Ghent was looking to take maximum points over the top of the Porte de Ballets, and as things stand, he's in danger of only taking third place and 12 points. Now there's just one at the head of the race, and he's all on his own. 1K to go to the top of the Porte de Ballets, and then he will, if he survives that, and I think he will, take the race down onto the descent and hit the bottom of the Col de Péosord, probably on his own. Gautier's dug in, recovered really well. Uh, Thomas de Ghent, about 3K from the top of the climb, cracked, was passed and attacked by Cummings, who'd sat on his wheel, and Gautier is now on terms with de Ghent. And there you go. That means after these two are caught, there's only three riders, I think, three or four riders maximum in front of the, the yellow jersey group. Uh, there you go. There's only two riders in front now. After Kenda Court and Julian Simon are caught, that's it. So now that's, this is great news for Ambar Geeks. Potentially going to get third place on the summit. And, uh, sorry, fourth place. Or even fifth. I've got a feeling Stefan Kung is still somewhere in the mountain right, right, blue. Possibly, yeah. I mean, it's possible, David. We haven't seen him. Uh, what we do know that is uh, Cyril Gautier and Thomas Degent are second and third on the road and Cummings is uh, going to be unopposed over the top of this climb. There's no doubt about that. He's well inside the final kilometre of the Porte de Ballets. And impressively, he's been held, holding that gap fairly stable, even after those attacks from behind and the, the increasing of pace from Team Sky, who are now, Chris Froome was now down to only, I say only, three teammates in front of him when very few team leaders up there have any riders left with them. So Team Sky are still in the dominant position, and we now know for sure that they want to win the stage. Before, we, we wondered what it was, we, we questioned it, but but now they've made they've marked this stage as where they want to big a big hit on GC and they want to do that by winning the stage as well. This man is just battling for stage victory. The British national champion in the Pyrenees is at it again. This is a much, much harder race situation though for Steve Cummings to master with uh, such a furious GC race and such a furious pace being set by Team Sky behind him. And if he pulls this one off, this really will be his crowning glory in terms of his. Uh, Tour de France career. Now Bagui attacks again. Bagui is looking for King of the Mountains points. They'll let him go because they understand that's what he's all about. He's no threat in the general classification. But he might just have spotted a rider ahead of him, not Steve Cummings. He'll be looking perhaps at Stefan Kung or maybe even Gautier and, uh, and uh, Thomas de Ghent as Steve Cummings takes maximum 20 points. These two will scrap it out for second and third place. There's Thomas again still sprinting ahead of, uh, of Cyril Gautier when it would be quite useful probably to have him uh, when it comes down to the descent and, and the, beginning, the beginning passages of Perisord. But the bottom line is Pete, Steve Cummings is just smashing this at the moment. And Warren Bargil is going to be his mission now is to try and get up to Steve Cummings. There is Warren Buggy. What's he got in front of him? A bunch of motorbikes, some cars, some loads of fans in the gloom here at the Porte de Ballets. Loads of polka dot jerseys as well, inspired by this ride by this Frenchman who is uh, chasing down Thomas de Ghent, who's worn the jersey on six days of last year's Tour de France. 
and has taken or will he's, take second place over he's the He's coming up and still good to you there very fast. Look, there. Yep. So that's uh, so he is bringing them back. He's pegging them back. He knew he had to go to try and get maximal points. So and that's perhaps why Thomas de Gent went. He heard that said that Juan Bagil had attacked behind, so he just wanted to make sure that he got there before he caught him. OK, de Gent has taken second place, and he is on 32 points in the King of the Mountains competition. All very well and good, but Warren Bagil now picks up a significant haul of points, not quite catching Cyril Gauthier, but he bags himself another 10 points, and he is now on 70. Steve Cummings now. What can so, he do on this descent? So 15 k's of descent, then straight back up again. So this is a, a long technical descent. Oh! Uh, uh, so, oh, there he goes down. Yes, yeah, so, so, I think he's just so exhausted. Hence, yeah. he'd all missed that corner before. Ow. And uh, so, poor guy. Looks like it was OK. I think he'd rubbed off a lot of speed and fairly muddy banking. But still, yeah, I think that's, that's exhaustion has pure, completely set in there. Thomas de Gent. That's, that's Bargy coming up behind him now. So Thomas de Gent just let go. All he wanted was those points. As we said before, he treated that as a finish line. There's Bargio coming by. So Bargio's just ripping this descent now, but I think it's still over a minute, a minute and a half behind, according to what I've heard. So he's brought back 30 seconds or so on Steve Cummings. That's still a big ask to bring back a minute and a half before Team Sky catch them. So races within races on the descent of the Porta Vallez. Steve Cummings is after a, a stage win once again. De Gent and Bagui initially battling for King of the Mountains points, but behind them, the big GC battle has distilled down to the very, very bare essentials. The yellow jersey has forced a selection. Just the leaders are about to do battle, surely on the Col de Peo sword. Welcome back. The British Road Race champion Steve Cummings is on it again, but this time the margin is mighty fine. He has started to climb the Col de Pere Sword. Meanwhile, the yellow jersey group now are hitting the bottom of that climb. And Chris Froome's come to a halt with Fabio Aru. What on earth has gone on there? Off the road. Once again, uh, Chris Froome has come unstuck. Haven't seen how that happened or what might possibly have just overcooked a corner, possibly. Well, it looks like they just... Honestly, I think that's just what happened. It, I, I'll look at it again, but I think it's what's... Because what, no one's crashed. It oh, must be, there you go. Mikko so Lang has gone through fine. Mikko Nievi, he's... Oh! He's managed to squeeze through there. And then Chris Froome, he's very <laughs> lucky. But that's just... They've just overshot the corner. Well, but it's Mikko Nievi's fault, not Mikko Landa. Aru affected by that as well. But uh, So Mikko Nievi just found a gap between two camper vans. And I think, by the way, that he's managed to clip in and get going again with Aru alongside it. Kriakovsky's come back to work, wake, uh, wait and work for him. It looks like his bike's working OK. The panic seems to be dissipating. But once again... As we look at uh, Quintana and the rest of Bardet, yeah. the rest of the group, it looks like they're just riding a uh, tempo there and not quite dare. No, there's a shake of the heads from Quintana there and uh, they're not attacking at this point. So uh, the yellow jersey, all things being equal, should be able to uh, get back. All right, so there it is once again. Chris Froome in trouble, off the road, but back in the race. This is typical Froome, isn't it? It's what happens to Chris Froome. Yeah, it wasn't at all his fault. And uh, hats off to him and Yevi getting out of that uh, without even a scratch uh, or a mechanical or anything. But, yeah, it's probably given them an adrenaline hit that's going to benefit them now. So, had that happened, I mean, there wasn't, there won't, won't be... Well, there is a descent, actually, a little bit further up the hill before the final climb. But had that happened with less of the mountain to go, do you think they would have waited, David? No, then you go. I mean, that's... It, it so this was, was a tactical... This wasn't, this wasn't an etiquette thing. This was tactical that on this had occasion. nothing to do with etiquette. The Paris Sword is a fairly rolling climb. This first half of it, look, it's like tailwind as well. As I said, you go there, you just open yourself up to being counter-attacked. Uh, we never see any riders attacking from the bottom of a climb. And, as we said before, there's only one team that has any, more, has any domestiques left, and that's AG2R. So it's all leaders. No leader's going to reveal themselves there. What they needed, what, what Aru needed was Fugel sang there, but he couldn't because he got caught out. What Robin Bardet needed was three very strong riders. Look at his teammate, Gautier, who's well after a crash. He can't do much. His other teammate behind him, Bestar, can't do anything either. Everyone else is on their own. So it would have been a case of a leader attacking and then being slaughtered by Team Sky because they just reel him back in and everyone else would counter him. So it was purely tactical, I think. Chris Froome's got his troops back on the front. Fabio Aru is back on the wheel. And, and that natural order, that pecking order in the GC is restored for now. The attacks will come. And they might well come from Chris Froome himself, who's survived another scare. Nilo Quintana is losing contact once again, disappointingly from his perspective and for his team with that group of favourites. Um, but those surviving 
highly placed within a minute of the yellow jersey if they'd got together as almost as a team at that point and worked for each other and as a group could they have could they have made that attack stick and taken advantage of that situation no 100 percent no because a, of because of the strength how strong that look everyone's blowing up they're all they're all on the limit and they know that the yellow jersey still has three teammates Nairo Quintana's dropped yeah and they always see more and more riders just fire off the back now Warren Barguiz on the limit they, they were all there and I think they just thought oh a moment of respite you know what the team sky have just been reaming them all day and just destroying the race and as you see they're all just getting blown out the back that happened and everyone's like oh well, you should have attacked the yellow jersey they can't they're tired simple as Kriakowski, Nievi, Landa, Froome. Pierre Latour now uh, from ag 2 la Mondial, the next rider just dropping off the back as Nairo Quintana, yeah, the mystery year from Nairo Quintana. Second place on the Giro d'Italia. Some people thought, many people thought he might have held something back on the Giro d'Italia and come to the Tour de France fresh. It doesn't appear to be the case. This man who has had his injury uh, season, his season, I should say, disrupted by a serious injury, uh, came back absolutely flew at the British National Championships, took the time trial, took the British National Road Race Championships and has seized his opportunity to get in the breakaway and try and ride to victory today. But Warren Barguilus looked like one of the strongest climbers in this race in the polka dot jersey is the next rider to drop off that group of favourites. And this is what's going to happen. They're just, look, they're just destroying the group and he's still got three teammates for, with him, uh, the yellow jersey of Chris Froome. And uh, that's just the leaders left. That's the top six or seven riders on GC and with Team Sky with four riders there. So anybody that questions the unwritten rules about these riders not attacking Team Sky, they don't understand bike racing because you couldn't, they couldn't, they knew that. Well, a Union Jack by the side of the road there, hollering support into the ear of the British National Road Race champion who passes through five kilometres to go to the top of the climb, ten kilometres to go until the end of the race. Here we go, Kriakowski's in his final push now, I think, so he's just going to empty himself out now before handing over to Nievi. Mikael Lander, thankfully, them, appears to be on a good day. And here's where the climb, as we watch Buggy losing contact as well and taking up some water to pour over the back of his neck, here's where the nature of the climb slightly changes as well. You start to shoot through most of the trees and the villages, and now, when we're about 4K to go to the top of the climb, he'll look up and he'll see the trademark switchbacks of the Peiro Sword snaking up to the shoulder of uh, the hill and passing over to that short descent and then the big finale. Question is, will Cummings even get to the top of the Peiro Sword before the catch? Look at the time gap coming down. So that's Kriakowski going as hard as he can in that final push. And I think they've just said, look, keep it a bit longer. Because Chris Froome, again, as we talk about lucidity, that rationale, rational thought, he wants it to keep as many teammates for as long as possible as he can. Because that way, he'd like, I think he'd like to keep teammates all the way to the final 500 metres final K. So they can just hit them hard really hard. He at least wants to get over to the top of this with at least one teammate, I'm sure. And that's exactly what I was just talking about, those switchbacks that mark the top of the Pale of the Sword. You can see it, the gap between the forest and over the top, they head into the sunshine. Now uh, it's Nievi on the front, and now Mika Landa is poised to take over after Nievi has done his turn. That's the end for Mihail Kwiatkowski, and what a turn that was. Chris Froome and his team are doing the damage, but still, most of the leaders are hanging onto his wheel. 4.4 to go for Steve Cummings to the top of the climb. That is the top of the Col de Perezord. Spectacular, if slightly misty, images from the helicopter. In sunshine at the moment, down in the uh, sl slightly lower slopes, but up top it is a... a Proper mountain top with mountain mist rolling over it. Look at this. So now it'll be Nievi's job to get it over the Pera Sword. Uh, this is the. It's, as we see in sprints, we see peel offs. We're seeing long climb. This is what GC climbing peel offs are like. They go on for kilometres and they're, uh, they're hard, they're hurt, they hurt in a much different way. They're, they're, they, they go on for a very long time. And as you say, when, they, when you come off, you come to a standstill, like Kwiatkowski. Bargiel, who just can't make ground. I think he's realising now. I think he was hoping he could maybe latch back on and score some points. That's not going to happen now. Steve Cummings, finally, we can see the difference. The body language has changed. I think the, the lights are dimming. Before long, they'll be out. He knows it's over for today, Steve Cummings, and wily old fox that he is, he probably won't expend too much more energy just for the sheer panache of it. Hopefully from a, a 
Steve Cummings' perspective, he can live to fight another day. The massive central, if he can recover in time, that's only a few days away, might provide a platform. If not, there are transitional stages in the Alps where he can make his mark, but it's not going to happen today. Mikkel Nievi and Mikkel Lander are going to bring the yellow jersey up to the shoulder of Steve Cummings very soon and then past him. But... Much as this has been perfectly set up by Team Sky and Chris Froome at the moment, at some point he's going to have to drop uh, those big competitors that he eyes up in his uh, rearview mirror in terms of the general classification. Most presently of all, the man who is glued to his rear wheel, the Italian national champion, uh, Fabio Aru, who's already taken a stage victory on the uphill finish. And remember, there are only three on the Tour de France this year. Aru was the strongest on La Planche des Belfi, admittedly. This mountain is much bigger, the stage has been much bigger, and it's been differently raced. Steve Cummings applying the mercy shot to himself and uh, pulling the trigger, and he's gone. For Aru, this is a massive opportunity. I think so. Stage 12 in the Tour de France, and he's, he's, in, he's within grasp of taking yellow jersey. So now it's all on him. He, he shouldn't attack early. He's probably going to wait as long as possible and, and shadow Chris Froome until the very last moment and try and use that explosiveness that he has, take seven, se seven eight seconds out, and then win the stage and hope that Chris Froome doesn't even get second or third. Uh, I mean, that would be the the same tactic to use, would just wait as long as possible, let Chris Froome, if he does, run out of teammates, attack, follow him, let him tire himself out, and then attack him as late as possible. And it's so noticeable, isn't it, that he only sees yellow, Fabiado. He is just glued to Froome's wheel, he won't leave that position, and Bardet is looking at the two riders ahead of him in the general classification as well. A reminder of how things stand, because it's all about the general classification today. Uh, Roman Bardet is in third place at 51 seconds. Fabio Aru is only 18 seconds down on the yellow jersey of Chris Froome. Nairo Quintana started the day in eighth place at 2 minutes and 13, and at the end of the day, he's going to be a lot, lot worse off in, in terms of the general classification than that. That's another terrible day. One of the worst we've ever seen from Nairo Quintana on the Tour de France. He has been emphatically dropped. Those little gaps we saw before aren't opening up. Everyone's overlapping their wheels slightly, which means Mikhail Nievi is slowing down. He's running out of gas. Whereas Chris Freeman will have to make a call soon. Does he let the, the pace drop a little bit and keep Nievi till the summit, or does he ask Lander to take over? Does he dare to take Fabio Aru close to that final kilometre? He has, to, he has to drop him beforehand, in theory, doesn't he? Unless he just backs himself to, to, to sprint past Aru on those brutal last slopes. But it's a high-risk strategy. So just to remind you, with the factoring in the time bonuses, let me give you a hypothetical situation here. Fabio Aru wins the stage, and he distances Chris Froome by 12 seconds on that final gap, which is unlikely, but it's not impossible. Uh, he's the yellow jersey, even given Chris Froome's uh, six seconds that he would pick up for a theoretical second place. That's enough hypothetical though, uh, these racers will all be thinking about the way the final 6.7 kilometres of today's stage might pan out. Point of the matter is, and the great thing about a stage like this on the Tour, none of us have the faintest idea. They're all playing a waiting game now because they all know how strong Chris Froome and Aru are and the fact that, they, that Chris Froome is deliberately holding Mikko Nievi's pace, just telling him to get to the summit, not asking him to do any heroics. He said, just get me over, and then he probably won't last long on the final punch up to Pedigood, but then even if he doesn't, he can hand over to Lander. Well, it's been uh, dramatic in unexpected ways once again on the Tour de France, and once again it's involved the yellow jersey mishaps and recovery and we've got plenty of racing still to come delicately poised for Nairo Quintana though not the best day on his bike fantastic scenes at the top of the pair of swords one more switch back to negotiate and then there's a long long stretch all the way up to a right-handed turn and that'll take them over the collar of land the the top of the col de pair of swords here we go then turn left-handed round the hairpin leading them all round, and they're all still holding the wheels. Nobody in distress at the moment. Nievi still setting a Nievi pace. Lander, though, poised to take uh, Chris Froome in the yellow jersey onto the lower slopes of the final climb. I say lower slopes, it's very, very short, the final climb, uh, just over two kilometres. Steep, then slightly less steep, then ridiculously steep. Finally, finally, Contador's looking like he's paying now, and he's just slipped for the first time to the back of that very elite group of favourites, just losing contact now, hauling himself out of his saddle, riding like Contador does in theory, but not at the front of the group of favourites. This time, it's not going to stick for Contador. He's grimacing, he has been on the attack, he's showing signs of recovery, but unless he can get back onto this group very quickly, 
On this evidence, he might just lose a little bit more time in the general classification, a race that he has not entirely given up on. Valiant ride from Alberto Contador, but he's the first of this fav these favourites now over the course of the last six or seven kilometres to get dropped. Martin skipped past Contador and is just moving up now onto the wheel of Rigoberto Uran and then Roman Bardet and Fabio Rousseau. Yep, the, the natural order of the general classification is absolutely taking shape as they go over the top of the Pere Sword. Mikkel Nievi leading Mikkel Lander. Then comes the yellow jersey, then it's one, two, three, four, five. The top five in the general classification. And they're about to drop down for the big set-piece, showpiece finale up the Pere Good. George Bennett reaches into his back pocket from Lotto and El Yumbo. What a great ride from him, living in this kind of very exalted company. Simon Yates is the last in this line of, what, some 10 riders now heading down, dropping downhill very, very quickly. It's a sharp descent, this, until they hit the final turn and they all start to climb up to the airfield. And the first ramps of this climb are very, very steep indeed. Four kilometres to go for Simon Yates at the back of this group in the white jersey. Louis Meinkes is his new nearest rival in the white jersey competition, uh, but he's two and a half minutes down on Simon Yates. Meanwhile, on the pay of a sword and still just climbing out of his saddle now and losing time, Nairo Quintana started the day in eighth position in the general classification. He might just be top ten because of Jakob Fulsang dropping down the rankings as well, but he will be a lot further down in terms of time on the yellow jersey, and it's just not happening for Quintana on this Tour de France. No, it isn't. It's always a, a little bit... I don't know, disheartening or even a little bit sad to see one of the great champions suffering like that, but he's carrying on, which is why he is a champion. This man, meanwhile, has had an eventful day and an eventful uh, descent of the Porte de Balaise before they hit this, uh, well, penultimate climb up the Pierre Sword, but he's recovered his position and his team have done what he's asked precisely of them, almost to the letter almost uh, without putting a foot wrong, except for Mikkel Nievi, who took the wrong line on that descent, but the recovery has been immense. And uh, Chris Froome is still talking to the team car, still talking to the team, still di discussing tactics and still thinking. Pretty think soon, though, he's going to put everyone on the limit as they we turn off the descent and onto the climb. He'll be telling his teammates what to do. He won't be talking to the car anymore because he can't hear anything on the descent. Even if you shout, you can't with all the people at the side of the road and the wind. So he'll be telling them what he wants from them. He'll have told Nievi, how much to do 500 metres or do a K? Or he'll be telling Lander, take me to 500 metres to go. He'll be giving them strict instructions of what he wants from them. Nieves still on the front for longer than you might have anticipated. Lander looking incredibly cool, calm and collected. Surely Nieves can't do too much longer. Contador now is on the slopes of this climb, trying to hold on to his position on the road. He will just battle his way, Contador, all the way to the top if he can. Two kilometres, though, to the group of favourites, and some of the steeper bits of climbing are right here. And Nieves just pulled off, so that was it. He asked Nieves to do the first 500 metres. Now it's up to Lander to go as hard as he can for as long as he can. Hopefully we'll see that there Go. Okay, so Lander is in charge now. Lander's the last domestique in this group. Everyone else is riding for themselves and for their position in the white jersey competition and in the general classification. Lander's looking so good. Fabio Aru, though, is looking focused, concentrated, strong, powerful, and as if he knows exactly what his own capabilities are and exactly what he has to do and where he has to do it on this climb up to the finish line. Steep here, they get a little bit of respite through one kilometre, and then maybe the battle will happen in the final 500 metres between the favourites. Well, clearly the tactic is for Lander to take Chris Froome all the way to that steep section, because he's not a, he's not at 100% yet, or 98%. He's kind of sitting there at a steady state. I mean, incredibly intense effort, don't get me wrong. But I think that means that he's been told by Chris Froome to take him to the bottom of the ramp, and I guess that's always been their plan, to get him, destroy the race, place Chris Froome at the bottom of that 500-metre ramp, ready to go. Well, it's a, it's a display of extraordinary confidence from Chris Froome that he can dispense of the likes of Bardet, Martin, Uran, Meinkies, and most significantly the man in second place in the general classification, Fabio Aru. But he backs himself clearly to do it uh, right at the very end. But Aru will feel the same, unless Aru's just questioning whether or not he needs to go a bit earlier.
Doesn't look like it, though. He looks like he wants to save it for the very last as well. Yeah, I think we're coming into... This is going to be a, the worst ever sprint for anybody, I think. <laughs> it's kind of, look at this group. And look, Mikko Landers just looking behind, just making sure, checking that everything's going on OK. And, yeah, this is exactly what's happening. It's a slow-motion lead-out. He's just leading them out. Chris Froome's just checking behind, staying on the left-hand side. They keep to this left-hand side of the barriers. The only place people can go is on the right-hand side. So that's what they have to do now, is make sure if somebody's going to attack, they have to go by on the right. Hence why he just keeps looking over the right, his right shoulder. So he has got uh, Fabio Aru very much in sight. Contador is uh, detached from the back, and so too is Quintana further back down the road. The battle's happening further up the road. These men are losing time in the general classification. Quintana doesn't look like he's suffering, but his uh, GC chances are hurting just as much as Alberto Contador is hurting. Two great Grand Tour winners in their own right, and they are dropping out of contention. This is where the battle's happening. Landa now leads them around this gentle left-hand curve, and just here would be the worst place to attack for any of these riders, because the gradient just dips ever so slightly. Martin's so, moving closer to the front. Look how controlled Lander is. He's riding, trying to keep it as smooth as possible. He's probably going to wind it up at just the right moment. He'll be listening to Chris Froome, and Chris Froome will be controlling him completely. As Sprinter's doing a sprint, the lead out. Look, Chris Froome just checking still, checking what's going behind. Here we go, Lander's accelerating, so he's told him. Watch out for uh, Chris Froome, watch out for Fabiano, who's going to be the first to attack? Someone has to attack, there's a stage win up for grabs. Martin moving now alongside Roman Bardet, moving alongside Fabiano into second place behind the yellow jersey. Dan Martin signalling his attentions. Uh, Chris Froome hasn't looked over his shoulder now, but if he does, he will see that there's a change in personnel on his uh, right shoulder. Dan Martin looking like if he can, he will attack, but that is a face of pain from Dan Martin. He won't attack now, this is going to turn into a very on speed. Remember, it's one kilometre, but it's probably take three and a half minutes or so, because we, we estimate about 10 kilometres an hour for those last 500 metres. So that, that equates to about one minute. So it's, go, it's going to be a very, very long, dragged-out affair. Look at Lander's face. Does he even know he's in a bike race? <laughs> Just such a measured, composed aspect to him. And Chris Froome has him doing precisely what Chris Froome wants him to do. 800 metres to go. And you can see how tactically astute Dan Martin is. Look, there George, goes. Bennett. George Bennett goes. George Bennett launching. is the first to attack, so, from Team Lotto and El Yumbo, representing New Zealand. They didn't expect that, did they? George Bennett, what a ride he is having. Starts to then 10th place in the general classification. All right, he's out of contention for the podium places at the moment, but 3.53, he is just looking for a stage win. Chris Froome doesn't have to react to him, but if he wants the 10-second time bonuses, yeah. he'll have to get across to, uh, to George Bennett. And look how it comes to Mikko Lander. That was George Bennett. It was his only option. He can't match his riders for explosivity on the final. Like that. He had to go early. Mikko Lander completely in control. <laughs> he's just like he's just weaving them in, having a quick look at the big screen. <laughs> but uh, here we go. Now look at Aru. Dan Martin just dropped back. And oh, now right? they're all placing. They know they can't sit on wheels here. They'll be too far back. Two bike lengths on this will just be devastating. Too far. Now here we go. Here it is. Here's where it should happen. Fabio Aru peels out to the left hand side of the road. Aru is the first to go. We expected that move, and here it comes. So Fabio Aru, he looks over his left shoulder, he sees Martin. Look how steep it is here as they zigzag from right to left. Aru, though, has the race lead. At the moment, Chris Froome is losing out to all three of uh, Roman Bardet, Dan Martin and Fabio Aru. Even Rigoberto Rad has gone past him. Louis Mankis sits on the wheel of the yellow jersey. Martin cracks Aru, Bardet, Oran, and they are all running away from the yellow jersey at the moment. Can Fabio Aru hold off the chase? Oran is on the wheel of Roman Bardet. Roman Bardet and Fabio Aru, and meanwhile, Chris Froome's going backwards all the way. Dan Martin still holds his position on the road. The yellow jersey has been swept past by, by Louis Mikers as Roman Bardet now gets past Fabio Ruiz. Is Roman Bardet going to beat them all on the climb in the Pyrenees where it matters? Roman Bardet, third place in the general classification. This is a major statement. We expected him to do it on the descent, but the great young French hope is doing it on a steep, steep climb in the high mountains of the Pyrenees. A brilliant victory. Oulan picks up second place. Fabio Aru picks up time over Chris Froome and a time bonus on the line. And Chris Froome has to battle the clock now, and I don't think he's going to make it. I think Fabio Aru, at the end of the day, will be the yellow jersey. And it's all gone wrong for Team Sky 
and it has gone wrong, I think, for Chris Froome. We'll get the stopwatch out, we'll work that out for sure. But Fabio Lu picked up four seconds and he gapped Chris Froome significantly there. So much to absorb. But first and foremost, the winner, Roman Bardet. Who first and foremost needed to lie down after that grinding sprint up the runway in which he overtook Fabio Aru. And Aru overtook Froome as the new race leader, confirmation of which he received within seconds of crossing the line. There's the result, Barde, Aru and Oran taking the first three places and time bonuses, with Froome 22 seconds behind Barde, 20 behind the other two. But look at the 20-second penalty next to the name of Oran and George Bennett in eighth. They were both penalised for taking a bottle inside the last 10 kilometres, which is against the rules. Oran here at the top of the Perisord, Bennett slightly earlier at 6.4 kilometres to go. However, Romain Bardet, just ahead of Bennett in the group, also clearly takes a bottle from a man in white and just as clearly seems to drink from it. He so far has no penalty. Behind all that drama, Nairo Quintana and Alberto Contador fell further out of contention. Warren Barguil held on to the King of the Mountains jersey comfortably and Marcel Kittel made it inside the time limit after doing his green jersey job early. So the third stage win of Roman Bardet's career and given the stakes and the opposition, probably the best. Yeah, it's the best because uh, it wasn't the, the last meter with all the big names, the, all the big guns, so uh, that means a lot and, uh, and the third in a row, so yeah, that's something big. How much do you believe in your chances of winning this Tour de France? Yeah, there is also the big, big stage tomorrow in the Pyrenees and um, and after the, in the Halp, it will uh, also be, be really tough. So, yeah, we have to just to keep focused, but uh, for sure we will uh, try, uh, this Team Sky will try to have his revenge, but uh, we have a pretty good team here and uh, try to do our best to, yeah, to, to get for the yellow contest. Well, Chris Froome's team did everything right today in whittling down the field for him, only for him to get whittled himself once the sprint started. And he might have given away the yellow jersey to Tony Martin for a few days in 2015, but he's never before had it taken from him the way Fabio Aru did today. There's the new GC. Aru leads Froome by six seconds. Bardet is at 25 seconds, although that could become 45 overnight, pending a review of his late bottle. Oran already has his penalty and is 55 instead of 35 seconds down. These penalties only added to the GC, by the way, not the stage. Behind them, it's Dan Martin, Simon Yates still in the white jersey, Mikel Landa, Nairo Quintana, George Bennett and Louis Meinkis. Chris, was that an average day or just a bad 30 seconds there at the end? That was a, that was, a, I mean, yeah, I had a, had a, had a bad moment there at the end. Um, no, no excuses. I just didn't have the legs there on the final kick. Um, I can only say congrats to Bardet for winning the stage and Fabio Root for taking the jersey. It's certainly going to be a, a big fight now all the way to Paris. Prima volta in tanti anni che si è visto un attimino di debolezza da parte di Froome. Ti dà beh, più che speranza. Anzi, sei tu in giallo adesso. Ma sì, adesso mi godo questo momento e domani sarà una tappa corta ma molto impegnativa, dedico questa, questo risultato a tutti i miei compagni, a, a Jacob che correva con due fratture, a Dario che ieri si è dovuto fermare e la dedico veramente a loro. In una parola ci credi? Ma bisogna crederci sempre. Now, almost forgotten in the way the stage finished was Steve Cummings' brilliant effort. He was the day's most aggressive rider. 